Though it is well below freezing here in Grand Rapids where I am, it is still a beautiful day in my neighborhood because I'm with you, the Valley Unitarian Universalist congregation and community. I'm Fred Wooden, uh, interim minister serving this community and whoever you are, wherever you are. We are together for a time of worship, which is simply to remember what matters most in this most peculiar world and commit ourselves again to living up to that hope. However long you have been here, a moment or a lifetime, you are part of this place and this time and this community. To mark that precious time, we gather our hearts and souls and minds through the agency of music. So I now invite Linda Muth to bring us together with our prelude. Good morning. Please join me by reciting aloud our chalice lighting words as Katie lights the chalice this morning. We kindle this flame, symbol of our faith, for the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of love, which calls us to work for justice. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, love to hear your voices. 
I'm Katie Seifert, the Director of Music Ministries. And today is the third Sunday in February in which we have been highlighting African-American composers, singers, and traditional spirituals in lieu of Black History Month. So let's join together for our opening hymn, an African-American spiritual led by Reverend Dr. Barbara Wells Tenhove. Due to the Omicron variant and the precautions set by our COVID team, please limit your singing to a hum if you are in the sanctuary. And if you are joining online, please sing along. But together, let's all enjoy the music this morning. And real quick, I want to say thank you to Lynn DeMuth for being here and blessing us with her piano music. So please join and come and go with me. This is hymn 1018 from Singing the Journey. And it's called Come and Go With Me. And though it's unknown exactly where it came from, we know it is from the African-American tradition. And it was first recorded in 1930 by Blind Willie Johnson. And so we invite you to join with us. Come and go with me. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land where I'm Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land where I'm bound. There'll be freedom in that land. Good morning, everyone. I am Marcy Bodum, your Director of Faith Formation. And in honor of Black History Month, I have a nice book for us today called Skin Again by Bell Hooks, illustrated by Chris Rashka. So, first slide. Hold on. <laughs> The skin I'm in is just a covering. It cannot tell my story. The skin I'm in is just a covering. If you want to know who I am, you have got to come inside and open your heart way wide. The skin I'm in looks good to me. It will let you know one small way 
to trace my identity. But then again, the skin I'm in will always be just a covering. It cannot tell my story. If you want to know who I am, you have got to come inside. Be with me, inside the me of me, all made up of stories, present, past, future. Some true to life and others all fun and fantasy, all the way I imagine me. You can find all about me, coming close and letting go of who you think I am. Before you come inside and let me be real, you become real to me. All real then, in that place where skin again is one small way to see me, but not real enough to be all the me of me or the you of you. For we are all inside made up of real history, real dreams, and the stuff of all we hope for when we can be all real together on the inside. Any of the children going with me to class can meet me out on the patio. Hello again. My name is Ken St. John. I'm escaping. My name is Ken St. John, and I am your associate in this morning's worship service. And I am here to say welcome. Welcome to you on Zoom. Welcome to you watching us on YouTube. And welcome to everyone here in person. Welcome to Valley Unitarian Universalist Congregation. Whether you joined VUU in the previous millennium, my tag says 1998, or you just connected with us for the very first time today, you are welcome here. Maybe you were with us pre-COVID, or perhaps you discovered us here in hybrid space. We're very happy to have you with us. You may be like our interim minister, the Reverend Dr. Fred Wooden, whose time with us is intentionally temporary. Or maybe you're just in town on vacation and this is the one and only day you'll be visiting us. We're super happy to have you with us. However long or brief your association with, or your association with us is, was, or will be, you are welcome here. Now, if there are any guests or first-time visitors on Zoom, please consider using the chat feature to make your presence known to the rest of the gallery. Any newcomers in the sanctuary are invited to stand briefly so that we can extend a warm greeting to you right now. Any visitors today? Very good, thank you. After the service, there will be opportunities to meet and greet in small groups, both online in breakout rooms and in person out on the patio. We have a baby comfort room here for uh, anyone, anytime there's a noisy person that needs to be separated from the crowd. We can't, you go in there and shut the door and we can't hear what's, uh, we can't hear you, but in theory you can hear us because there is a speaker in there, just not positive it's working. But you should be able to hear the service if you do go in there. The lay pastoral care associate in the sanctuary today is Joyce Donahue. And Melissa Bush will make her presence known to all of you on the Zoom, uh, through the Zoom chat message for everyone on Zoom. Joyce and Melissa are available today and all through the coming week to be a listening ear for anyone seeking emotional support, as we all do from time to time. Now last Sunday, Fred made it clear to us that we and he are not friends. And that's not because he doesn't like us or because his days with us are numbered, but because of the special relationship between clergy and their congregants. He's not coming to you or me when he feels like letting his hair down or venting his frustrations. And we can live with that, knowing that as a congregation, we're his fourth priority 
behind his self, spouse, and children. Were we to be his friends, where would that put us? Fifth place at best. And we'd be just a step away from being the local barista or a cashier at the grocery store. So I'm happy to be a congregant. But even without the label of friendship, we can still say, we love you, Fred, and our hearts are with you and your courageous wife, Wendy, as she experiences her cancer treatment. This morning, Fred will once again debunk the old phoning it in insult by iPhoning in another inspiring sermon on the secret lives of ministers from Zoomland. This time, we'll learn the perils of running church as a business. I was thinking about this as I was getting ready this morning, that if, if we did run the church like a business, I think it would be show business. I've got lights and cameras and microphone and an audience, at least on Sunday morning. And for cabaret, it's all show business. But let's get back to the script. That reminds me, uh, running business reminds me of the conservative mantra that government should be run like a business. And I think there's some appeal to that concept. The drive for profit demands efficiency and innovation. And those are usually good things, and sometimes they're hard to motivate in civil service. But ultimately, I think government needs to govern, and it's not the same as running a business. And many of us have experience on other non-church, non-profit organizations, perhaps serving on boards. And I've seen times of turmoil when someone in a leadership position at a nonprofit wants to run the organization like a business. It's not always a good match. Volunteer people are motivated differently than paid people. And organizations are always about people. I'm interested now to get a glimpse behind the curtain at the business of church. But first, let's go back to Fred in Grand Rapids for these words about generating revenue to improve our bottom line. Thank you. Boy, Ken, what a great lead in you offer me. Uh, yeah, we do have to do business in a certain way. And I'm going to talk about that later. And can you, I can now do half the sermon I planned. Thank you. Uh, actually, that's not true. But nothing is more like business than the moment when we ask for your financial support. You may have noticed that I spend more time on that than other clergy. Most of the time, if you go to church, they'll say, well, now take our morning offering and off you go. Not for nothing do we have the phrase filthy lucre which we do not want to pollute the, the purity of our spiritual time. Thus, most clergy go past it as fast as possible, as though literally it made us dirty and that would look bad. But what if we thought of the offering as a spiritual opportunity for money laundering instead? If it's so filthy, why can't we clean it up? And we can't. That sounds shocking, perhaps, but it is, in fact, what we do. Here is where your money does the good that you cannot because your time is limited, because you only have two hands and a few hours. How much good can you do? Not nearly as much with your own self as you can with your wealth, whatever that is. How much good are you willing to do this week? That's how much you should put in the plate. So I'll tell you how. Let's see that slide. You can text, you can click, you can email, you can, you can call, you can do whatever you want. And in a few moments, our ushers will make those in the sanctuary or give those in the sanctuary a chance to do that. But every gift, Make sure the good you want to get done gets closer to being done. And so now I'm going to invite our wonderful volunteer pianist, Linda Booth, to help us through our offering time with a wonderful gift of music as our ushers take the morning offering.
prayer, or Fred, did you want to do the prayer? Did we lose him? No, I can do that. I was just letting the music kind of sit on me for a moment. It's one of our it most beautiful, beautiful songs. Thank you. And thank you, Lynn, for offering. <laughs> do you know the words? It's one we don't often sing because they're rather more conventional. Come Sunday, oh, come Sunday, that's the day. Duke Ellington was Roman Catholic, child of Washington, D.C. And he was a very religious man, and many of his works that we don't know well were sacred works. But he brought a personal presence to his faith. It wasn't automatic. It wasn't routine. It wasn't rote or ritual. There was a certain authenticity to his presence in worship, even in that solemn and uh, ceremonial context that is Roman Catholicism. Sunday, oh, come Sunday. That's the day. Is that your day? Is that the day that you set aside in some way? Do you make it different? In the Jewish tradition, Saturday is set aside, treated very differently, and the very observant among the Jewish community withdraw from the world of business and focus on the world of being. Even so much that they do as little as they possibly can, reminding them that our task is not to produce, but also to savor, not simply to work, but to enjoy the fruits of labor. I'm not sure we do that the way we used to, when the rhythms of life told us to stop and look and listen. At most, you'll do it for the next hour, and then you will go home or I will find a domestic task here at home and I'll resume my productive ways. I wonder though, whether we are doing what we ought to when we only focus on doing and not being. Is there not value in the savoring and the Witnessing, which is what Annie Dillard calls it, witnessing creation. I so appreciate the, the photographs that Randall Casillas posts on Facebook regularly of the morning as she walks, reminding me to notice as I walk. If we cannot make a day without doing, we can make an hour or a moment of noticing. So much of the work we do around racial justice is about seeing those who are unseen in our production-based world. So my prayer for you this morning is that you stop, you look, you listen, notice, notice it all. For what good is it if no one is paying attention? With that thought in mind, Katie, would you help us out? Yeah, in this time of centering, let's be, as Reverend Fred has invited us to do relax, go within and find that connection to ourselves, to each other, and to the power of faith, hope, and dreams. We will use our hymn number 1020 in our teal hymnal, if you have it, Wo Ya Ya, to help us. This song was written in 1971 by the members of Osabisa, 
a Genehan English Afro rock band with an explosive onstage vibrance and charisma. Osabisa was a huge success in the 1970s and still are today, drawing in audiences around the world and mentoring the likes of the Rolling Stones, Paul McCartney, and Stevie Wonder, who were mesmerized by their joyful music. You can see it in that picture. So please join my video twin in a moment in Osabisa's Wo Ya Ya, which translates from the Ganehan Ga language as we are going. As we are in the space of meditation, let's all take a deep breath together, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth, filling our lungs as deep as we can. Breathe in.
you may find it hard to believe, but getting a job has never been easy for me. I am here only because I was the only interim minister left over after all the other ministers had been picked. I am a clerical wallflower. In fact, that goes back to the beginning of my career. When I finished seminary in 1979, I waved by to all my colleagues going off to their churches. And it took a whole other year for me to get a job. And that job was in a tiny church in a tiny town in remote rural Massachusetts. It was the perfect place to be. But when I realized the church had very little and the religious educator near my seminary had some office equipment she wanted to get rid of, I drove over to her office and picked up a ditto machine and a thermal copier and added it alongside my old Underwood typewriter, a manual that was so old you almost had to hit the keys to make the letters print. Even tiny churches in remote towns need equipment. The real world of making an institution operate is never far away. Our church there had a steeple and in the steeple was the town clock. Yes, in Massachusetts and New England, there are town clocks and they're often in the old church downtown. And sometimes I had to climb up the steeple and wind the clock to make sure it didn't stop. We lived in an old parsonage that needed fuel oil and I had to make sure that it was filled with enough oil that we didn't freeze. And I had to write the check for it. The white paint on the meeting house peeled because we were on a hill and the wind would slowly peel it off. And in winter, we would close the great big sanctuary and move into a little, into the outbuilding that was our education space to save money. And they needed a clock there, or at least I did, because I wanted to make sure I didn't preach too long. And because they didn't have one, I gave them a clock that I inherited from my great aunt when she died. Churches are spiritual endeavors, but they are worldly institutions. This month I am sharing secrets your minister never told you. And after reeling, revealing something of the inner life of the minister, I'm going to turn to the hidden life of the church that we clergy face on a regular, if not daily basis. <clears throat> the first of these two is one I wish to share about the, well, to share is that no church, and I mean the institution, not the community, ever has enough of three things, money, members, or what I call marble, meaning the physical material, the building, the stuff, in 40 years of ministry, I have served churches from 90 members, which was that first one, to 900 members, which was my last. I have monitored budgets that spent $60,000 a year to those that spent $1.2 million a year. And every one of them worried about annual giving, worried about attendance, and worried about the building and its repairs. This is, in a sense, a good thing, because if you think about it, only dying churches have enough of everything. But I would say that 70% of board meetings have been about money, members, and marble. Because of that, nominating committees, what we call here at VUU the Leadership Development Committee, have a real strong temptation to seek out people with experience in those areas. And these are often business people who deal with those things on a daily basis. They know about the bottom line. They are practical. And starting in the 1980s with the arrival of business experts like Peter Drucker and 
Jim Collins and Stephen Covey, church leaders started reading their books and using their books. We clergy started reading their books too. Perhaps we thought if we treated our churches more like businesses, we would do better when it comes to raising money, attracting members and caring for our physical stuff, the marble. And some of us did. In fact, many of those mega churches you know about are the result of business plans that are designed to reach a, an, an underserved market, to deliver a product that the market wants. And that can be uh, for unchurched people to provide contemporary music, to do uh, food courts or support groups or all those things. There is now a very strong presence of business thinking and modern Protestantism. It's washed over into Catholicism. There are books, there are seminars, there are experts, and it makes a certain degree of sense. Religious institutions are not exempt from reality. We begin to think we're in competition with each other to get the unchurched, to make sure they don't go to that church, but come to our church. I understand it. But in some of my most recent years, I've begun to worry that the church biz has become that, a biz, a business. And we begin to think that business people, as Ken pointed out, are somehow better at running organizations, especially here in America, whereas Calvin Coolidge is supposed to have said, the business of America is business. There is obviously a long history of America and business. Did you know that over half the people on the Mayflower were not pilgrims, but what they called strangers, adventurers, people who came across the ocean to get rich, to make their fortune. Half, over half. Everyone in Jamestown was here to make a buck or a pound as the case may be. They weren't here to convert the Indians. Most of the English colonies were economic adventures, often formed as companies. And while they may have had religious purposes at some level, mostly they were about making money. Actually, the entire colonial endeavor for every nation, not just England, was about making money. Exploring all of that is a book, not a sermon, just we should realize that America, the nation we share, has always had a strong bias toward making money. And that's one of the reasons people immigrate here to begin with. So that's why we admire the businessman, whether that's the shrewd Yankee peddler, the, the plucky frontier farmer, or the Gilded Age tycoon. These are the models that we grew up admiring as being exemplary, in expressing the spirit of the nation. And religion is not immune to this reverence. Far from it. My last church had a long revered minister who they described as being so charismatic that if he needed to balance the budget, he could call on his rich members to write that check and make up for the shortfall. They bragged about his power to bring money in from the people with deep pockets. And he was not unique. I've heard it said of many of the star clergy that they were able to raise money. That was one of the things that made them great. Now, nimble thinkers can connect the dots better than I, but let me state this rather bluntly. My desire today is to reveal the risk of using business as the lens to measure church. Not that it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter as much as you might think. What comes to mind are those movies about gangsters, where a thug is about to murder someone and says, as if to ease the pain of the victim, it's nothing personal, it's only business, bang. To the victim though, it's very personal. And I worry that perhaps we might be the victim, we congregations. If gangsters are universally condemned for committing crimes to get rich, all those crimes are imposed on actual people, 
in the name of making money. Organized crime clearly values money more than people, power more than principle, and it will sacrifice the former to get the latter. That could be said though of any business, which is why we have laws against fraud, deceit, of adulterating products, of cheating people. Every business would or could do everything organized crime would do if we didn't make them against the law. Now I'm gonna make a personal political aside here. When I hear someone talk about a world without regulation, which is a point of view that some libertarians have, I'm tempted to say, well, we already have it. It's called organized crime. Back to being your preacher now. The line between business and religion though, is there and it's clear. We are personal. It's not about business. It is very personal. Our business is people and their well being, spiritual, personal, emotional, and dare I say, political and economic. The things business values, money and what money buys, people, power, prestige, are not the ends for us but the means. Our mission as a religion is not to increase our market share. It is not to corner the market. It is not to innovate. It is not to increase shareholder value. It is not to make a profit. It isn't even to improve efficiency. Our mission is to uphold dignity and worth, democracy and equality, moral and spiritual liberty, and their commensurate responsibility. These are what we and all religious communities are about. Ironically, Cal Coolidge, famous for not saying much, said more than the business of America is business. In that same speech, he goes on and says, of course, the accumulation of wealth cannot be justified as the chief end of existence. So long as wealth is made the means and not the end, we need not greatly fear it. I like that he says not greatly. He goes on though, but there will always be a minority who appeal to the baser instinct, who feel that their own temporary interest may be furthered by betraying the interest of others. Makes good sense, but we never hear that part. And that is why religious communities must be wary of adopting business models. The more successful they become, these business churches, the more they become businesses. And they become businesses of selling religion rather than religious communities lifting up the lives of those in them. Numbers, I agree, are alluring. At least we can count those things. But Something that can be counted is not necessarily something that counts. Though they would never read him, Emerson said, a person will worship something of that there is no doubt. It behooves us to be careful what we worship for what we are worshiping, we are becoming. To the extent churches and religion revere business, we become a business. But for us, it's always personal even in business. There is always a cost, one usually borne by those who have no choice, by those who have been treated as a means to an end. Virtually every challenge we face as a society involves the use of people by other people for profit, for power, for prestige. Virtually every ism we have, racism, sexism, heterosexism, ageism, ableism, they exist and continue to exist because they create profit for someone. Financial profit, power profit, status profit. And my interest today is to warn you to be careful what you worship, to distinguish the means from the ends, to remember that we are not in business to make a profit, but to make a difference. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. I know how. 
I know how to avoid this problem. In fact, I've avoided it my entire career, which is why none of my churches ever grew. None of them ever made money. None of them ever built a building. And yet, I have succeeded in planting and creating meaning, mission, and ministry in every congregation I have served. Because those are the things that all religious communities, including ours, are in business to do. Our mission is to give meaning to life by blessing and releasing the ministry that every person has to offer. Christians call it discipling, but every religion does this, or at least says they do. Buddhists enter the Dharma path. Hinduism practices different kinds of yoga, which means a lot more than breathing and posing. Muslims speak of the five pillars. Jews observe the covenant. Our genius as a liberal community is to see in all of these a common longing to find meaning in life, which involves a commitment to something larger than your own life. And that is what we mean by mission. When you discern that mission, it is always a summons to serve beyond yourself, not to gain, but to give. And the word that encompasses that is service, or the other word is ministry. Mission, meaning, and ministry are what we are in business to do. That's what all religious communities are in business to do. To succeed, they may need people. They will need money. They will need resources, buildings, equipment. But that's not why they exist, to have people, money, and stuff. Their purpose, our purpose, is to pursue our mission of giving meaning to lives by equipping people to find and live out their ministry, their service to others. In a very real sense, our business is the very opposite of business. Some decades ago, the chair of U.S. Steel told his board, we are not in business to make steel, but to make money. We are not in business to make money, but to make ministry, meaning, and mission happen. That can happen in any congregation of any size and shape. Last year, when I was talking about Susan Beaumont's book about uh, leading when you don't know where you're going, about leading and what she calls liminal times when things are in flux. She told a story in that book about an aging congregation downtown with a big building, but a very small congregation. They didn't want to move out, but they couldn't sustain it. So they went into partnership with a group in the neighborhood that could use the building more than they could and became tenants of those people. So they could continue to worship where they had been, but also give their building to a greater use than themselves. Now, I picked up this story because you did almost exactly that during the height of the pandemic when you couldn't be in the sanctuary to worship. You allowed a shelter to operate there 24 7 and never thought for a moment whether that was a good thing to do because you knew your ministry of service to others was why you were in business. You're not in business to be in the building. You're not in business to go to worship. I'm not in business to preach. We are in business to give meaning to lives by serving others. You knew that at that moment, and you did something wonderful because of it. Mission, meaning, ministry. That's what we're about. Money, members, marble, these are just the means, the resources. Sure, the more you have, the more you can do, and that's a great thing. But make sure that you're growing in mission as well as members, growing in meaning as well as money, growing in ministry more than in marble. And I mention all this because in a few weeks, you may have to choose a minister. And if you agree with what I said, and you'd better. Make sure your next leader understands this and will help you do it. That's all I've got to say this morning. I love being with you and thank you for your expressions of affection. I can tell you that Wendy is not thriving because no cancer treatment is pleasant, but she is more than surviving. And your care 
means a great deal to us both. More than that, your ministry to us means a great deal to all of us. With that in mind, I say thank you. And I'll hand this service back to Katie, who will lead us in our closing worship. Closing hymn. Thank you, Reverend Fred. Let's join one more time together in song with our video choir. And may the powerful words and hopeful melody from this African-American hymn, number 95 in our gray hymnal, There Is More Love Somewhere, remind us of this potent truth. We can all feel there's so much weight in the next couple months as we choose a new minister. And I think it's easy to think, Yes, those love coming and hope and all these great things coming with that new minister. And while that is true, I want to remind us that we can search even more within our own selves. Where is there more love within us? Where is there more hope that we can find within us and more joy that we can find within ourselves to bring to this community? So let's join with our video choir. There is more love somewhere. I had the privilege and the pleasure and the honor of being in South Africa. And one of the places I stopped to pay my respect silently and anonymously was at the home of the late Bishop Desmond Tutu, who kept a home in Soweto. His words come to me today. <clears throat> we must remember that liberation is costly. It needs unity. We must hold hands and refuse to be divided. We must be ready. Some of us will not see the day of our liberation physically, but those people will have contributed to the struggle. Let us be united and let us be filled with hope. Ken, would you help us end our hour of worship by extinguishing the chalice? Thank you. Everyone at home and here in the room, please read along out loud with me as we extinguish our chalice this morning. Though we extinguish the chalice, our connection to each other 
and this community remains. May its light guide us this week as we walk the path of justice, speak words of love, and fill our world with compassion until we meet again. Now, for those of you on Zoom, you will have the opportunity to join a breakout room. You'll be invited to one, but you can ignore that if you prefer and stay in the main room and chat with Reverend Fred and some others. And uh, everyone, wherever you are, go in peace. Thank you.